we've come to Genesis 28 when Jacob is running away from his brother and exhausted he stops he he lays down he makes a stone for a pillow he goes to sleep and he has a dream when he wakes up from this dream where he had the vision of the ladder stretching between earth and heaven and the angels of God going up and down on the ladder he he says something after receiving this great blessing from God he says something which is um, surprising something that we have to talk about in verse 16 it says Jacob woke from his sleep and said surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it now it could mean that Jacob believed that God was finite it could mean that Jacob did not fully appreciate the reality that God is present in all places at all times because after all the people who lived in the generation where when Jacob lived in the places where Jacob lived they believed in little gods and little goddesses who had little territories and you had one God of the mountain and you had one God of the valley you had one God of, of the sea and one God of the dry land you had one God of this country and another God of the next country so that you could outrun God or you one God or you came you passed out of the jurisdiction of one God and into the jurisdiction of another God but Jacob is, is discovering that he could outrun his his father's other son but he could not outrun his father's God he could get away from Esau but he couldn't get away from God why did he not know that God was in every place well he didn't really pay attention to God he was not a man who lived in the vertical plane he was a man who lived in the horizontal plane he was not a man yet who would learned to lift his eyes above the horizon and to think about God and to act upon God. But that's what he's going to learn on this journey which, which lasts for 20 years. Now, it could be that it wasn't that bad. It could be that all he meant was evidently this is a place where God shows himself. This is a place where God has shown up and made his presence felt or real and I didn't know it maybe that's all he means I don't know how it is in your language but in, in, in English we we talk about the presence of God the, the presence of God was there God was there what do we mean by that because we obviously believe in this attribute of God called omnipresence that is we believe that God is everywhere David writes or the psalmist writes in Psalm 139 that I can go to the highest place in heaven and God is there I can go to the deepest place in hell and God is there there's no place where God is not if God is not everywhere then he's not God so we can speak of God's presence in terms of his attribute his, his characteristic of omnipresence but also maybe you have an assignment in ministry maybe you go out witnessing or maybe you get a chance to teach children or maybe you get a chance to preach or maybe you get a chance to play an instrument or sing a song in church and your mother or your friend says how was it and you say God was really there well you already believed in God's omnipresence you wouldn't have denied that God was there so what what do you really mean what are you adding to the doctrine of God's omnipresence when you say well God was really there what you mean is well he was really there to bless me he show he showed his presence by blessing me but there's another way that we talk about God not only his omnipresence not only his blessing presence but what we might call his manifest presence 
where he really shows himself. He shows him in a, himself in a way that, that our senses can detect. We see him in a vision or a dream or we hear his voice. That's really, really supernatural. And that's what happened to Jacob. What he was saying was, I didn't know that this was a place where those kinds of things happened. I didn't realize that this was the place of the manifest presence of God. So he called that place Bethel, the house of God. This is a place where God lives. God dwells and abides in this place. He says, this is none other, verse 17, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Jacob has been thinking about the reward of God. He's been thinking about the birthright. He's been thinking about the blessing. He's been talking about, he's been thinking about the material and physical rewards which God gives. These thoughts have dominated his life. But now he, li he lifts his eyes above the horizon. He lifts his eyes from earth to heaven. Now he begins to think about God himself. God, his presence, an encounter with God, a personal relationship with God. And he builds, an, he builds a monument to the occasion. So Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put under his head and set, up, set it up as a pillar and poured oil on it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, the house of God. Now, some of you wear a ring on your finger. I lost mine in 1984. You're making a physical reminder to an event that took place, your wedding. Some of you got baptized. That's a, baptism is for many reasons, but one reason is it's a physical reminder of a spiritual event. It's something concrete that you point back to that reminds you that I've met God, I've trusted Christ, I've received forgiveness for my sin, I've been saved, I've been born again. I was baptized on this day. Jacob builds a monument to the event to remind himself, and he changes the name of the place. If we live very long, we need to be able to point to certain times, certain places, and we need to say, God met me there. God met me in that place. I was afraid. I was running away. I didn't know what was going to happen. But God met me in that place. The Puritan preacher Thomas Goodwin said, God's will cannot be understood in prospect. God's will can only be understood in retrospect. What does that mean? He meant, as we look forward to God's will, we really can't understand it. But when we look back on God's will, we can understand. When we look forward and think, what might God do? That's hard to understand. But when we look back and say, look what God has done, then we do understand. Well, Jacob is looking forward and he's looking back, but especially he's looking back in this place where God meets him. Now, um, God has made a promise to him. And because God has made a promise to Jacob, Jacob makes a promise to God. And by the way, that's what people do when they love each other. They make promises. That's what marriage is. You enter into a covenant and you make a promise to each other. God has been making promises to Abraham and to Isaac, and now he makes promises to Jacob, and Jacob makes a promise to God. In a way, it's a little bit conditional. Maybe it's not a perfect promise. Because he says, if God will be with me, Genesis 28, 20, if God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I will take and will give me food and water and clothes, if I come back to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. Well, I hope the Lord's going to be his God anyway. But then he does something else. He says, I will give God 10% of everything that I have. Here we see the tithe for the second time in the Bible. We see it in chapter 14 when Abram gives a tithe to Melchizedek. 
And we see it in 28, 22, when Jacob vows to tithe to God. In a way, Jacob doesn't do it unconditionally. He's asking for God's blessing, but at least he does it. At least now he's not just thinking about what God is going to give him. Now he's thinking about what he's going to give God. By the way, let me just mention this as a spiritual principle. In John chapter 2, when Jesus came to the wedding in Cana, Mary said to Jesus, they have no wine. And Jesus said, woman, what am I going to do with you? It's not time yet. Now, to me, First of all, I can't hear her request. I can only hear an observation. When she says they have no wine, it's, she, she should make an, an observation. But Jesus hears a request. Jesus hears her asking for something. And he, and he basically says, I can't do what you want. It's not time yet. So when, when we hear what Jesus says, all I can hear is a no. Mary apparently hears a yes because she runs to the servants and gives them the best advice in the history of the world. She says, whatever he tells you, do it. Get ready. It's a beautiful, deep thing that happens between Mary and Jesus at the beginning of John 2. But the principle I want to point out is this. Apparently, he was not going to give her what she wanted, but she was going to give him obedience. At the time when you do not think God is going to give you what you want, that is the most important time to give God what He wants. And let me also say this, it's much, much, much more important that you give God what He wants than it is for God to give you what you want. And be sure that in your prayer life, you beg God for the power to give him what he wants more seriously than you beg God to give you what you want. Always remember that. Jacob is making a little bargain. It's not a perfect thing that he does. He says, if you'll do this for me, I'll do, the, I'll do this, this for you. If you'll do that for me, I'll do this for you. But at least it's a beginning. It's a beginning. He's making a beginning. He's learning how to pray. He's learning how to make a promise to God, and he's learning how to offer God something. He's not very mature yet, but he's made a start. TVS Seminary is a great way to invest in the kingdom of God. Please consider making a donation to support this effective educational and outreach ministry today. We exist upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com.